Who was here last Sunday, last week Sunday? Who was here last week Sunday? Okay. I ask this because you, you may recall that uh, we spoke about the, the qualities of the Buddha and how they are related to our mental defilements. And how one of the qualities of the Buddha is uh, simplicity and renunciation. You may recall that. And how simplicity and renunciation is the medicine or antidote for uh, self-centered craving and attachment. How simplicity helps us to overcome uh, craving and how uh, renunciation helps us to overcome uh, personal attachment, personal clinging. <clears throat> Normally when we first heard the, uh, hear about renunciation, we think about cultural renunciation, which means somebody becoming a monk or a nun. But renunciation really is much more than becoming a, a monk or a nun. As we said last week, it's really the, the practice of, um, of letting go, of personal clinging and attachment. Because in my travels and experience, as a teaching, uh, Dhamma, uh, as a traveling Dhamma teacher and as a monk, I, I see that uh, you can, you can be a monk or, or a nun and still have a lot of attachments. What we call worldly, we still have a lot of worldly attachments. You know, craving for uh, material things and even uh, craving for personal, you know, aggrandizement, you know, more to, to enhance the ego. You know, wanting recognition, wanting fame, wanting titles. And that's just another form of craving. So in other words, the real renunciation, the real spirit of renunciation is in the mind. It's not whether you're wearing robes and having your head shaved. <laughs> that is only cultural, the external form of renunciation. The real renunciation is letting go in the mind of craving, ego clinging, attachments, you know, pride, arrogance, conceit, letting go of um, jealousy, aversion, hatred, resentment, and so on. So it is in the mind. And once you start to practice, it's, you can see the truth of it yourself. It's all in the mind. Everything begins with the mind. As they say, mind is the forerunner of all things. <clears throat> now, one of the, um, the aspects of, uh, of clinging I did mention, and I want to mention it today because it is very important, and that is when we cling to uh, mental formations i.e., you know, ideas, concepts, beliefs, views and opinions, and so on. Because when we cling to these things, they really cause suffering, they really cause conflict. And that's why so many people are caught in arguments and you know, fights over what I believe and what you believe, sometimes even what I like and what I don't like. And if, and if you don't like something that I like, of course, I feel I have to convince you that you must like it. <laughs> <laughs> or if you like somebody and you don't like that person, you want to convince that person why you should also dislike that person, you know. That's part of human behavior, because the clinging mind is so strong, as you know. 
Somebody won't like it. Like him, the clinging mind to uh, to glue. You know, you remember crazy glue, that instant fast bonding glue. The mind is like crazy glue. <laughs> it quickly bonds, quickly clings to something. <clears throat> and when we investigate, you see the strong clinging is really because of thinking. <clears throat> that is the essence of it. When we cling to all these mental formations, because. Thinking is just a strong, prominent aspect of consciousness. And when you, we're not trained at an early age, you know, to, to see the mind with mindfulness, of course, our entire identification, our entire world is thinking, mental reacting to everything. So that is our reality, our mental reactions, our mental world. And as what somebody said, really, when you really f reflect on life and our experiences, it's really 10% of things happening, you know, things, events, and 90% of our mental reacting to all, you know, what is happening. 90%, it's really true. And of course, our mental reactions is what creates our reality. Right? We think what we are reacting to is real. And what the Dhamma is teaching us that really it is a cause of suffering, cause of conflict. Because that is where our mental defilements lie. Ignorance, delusion, craving, clinging, you know, aversion, hatred, jealousy, envy and so on. <coughs> And is it this, this conditioning that we all have, this habitual reaction, which creates the idea of a permanent self? That's what ignorance is, is the clinging to the self. Or you can say, taking ourselves too seriously. So, and I, I mentioned too that, uh, The, the, the teaching of non-self, when we first encounter it, it's very difficult to understand, very, very challenging. Because, you know, we tend to say, you know, I exist. My name is so-and-so. You know, I'm, I'm working, I'm, I'm uh, having a certain profession. I have a family or I don't have a family. <clears throat> so what do you mean I don't exist? <laughs> Of course I exist. And also I get sick, I'm going to grow old and one day I'm going to die. Which I don't like. I don't like that idea, but there you go. So to, re to really understand this teaching of non-self is first we have to understand that we do have a self. Right? So whether we like it or not, because it's a part of our condition. Because, you know, as human beings, we're a result of social conditioning. Just like we have to learn languages, we have no choice, do we? To learn languages. From the home environment and, of course, from school and so on. We have no choice. We have to learn all these things. And we have to go to school. And even if you're having homeschooling, which is getting more popular these days, is still a part of our social uh, conditioning. We can't escape it. education. Just like the media, we can't escape the media. And now uh, we have internet and all that stuff. <clears throat> you know, and just our social ideas, including, including um, beliefs, you know, popular beliefs. And a lot of it is superstitious also, superstitious beliefs. So we have to understand, yes, we do have a self, but when we investigate, as the Buddha did, we begin to see that it's just a part of the conditioning in the mind. It's not something which is permanent, not something which is separate, independent from nature. <clears throat> but for centuries and centuries, all of the early civilizations believe in a permanent self because, of course, they were just trapped in thinking, right? in the conditioning. They didn't have the insight, the, 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 the mind training to really see 
the, the, the true nature of, of the mind, the thinking and so on, because it's thinking that creates the I, you see. And from this very ancient belief in a permanent I, self, naturally arose the belief in reincarnation. That when this, when the body dies, which it must, this seemingly permanent, solid, separate, independent I, the center of experience, which, and also the center of our world, will continue into a new body. Be, be reborn into a new body. And also, you see, when, when we cling to our mental formations, our beliefs, ideas, views, and opinions, we don't realize that it is the work of delusion, and very often the source of our conflicts. As we said, that's why people are always arguing. And of course, I am always right and you are wrong. <laughs> because for, for me to be right, you have to be wrong. It's like this. <laughs> but when you're really right, when you're really wise, you tell everyone they're right. <laughs> but of course, you know from your wisdom that they're all wrong. <laughs> what you say, oh yeah, you're right, you're right, whatever, you're right. <laughs> you know, just to keep them happy, keep them satisfied. <laughs> because after a while, it's really a waste of time to argue, especially in this climate. <laughs> That's why I don't argue with people. I always say, you believe what you want to believe. Doesn't matter. It can even believe the world is flat. Because some people still believe that. <laughs> and of course, if you live in the, some countries and you look outside, it is flat, very flat. Mm. You know, there are some places in North America where you look outside and you look everywhere and there's not a bump, not even a little bump inside. Totally flat, flat, flat. And it takes a while to get used to it, you know, especially when you're used to hills and mountains, right? And because it's so flat, the sky is enormous. You know, from one horizon to the next. Not a single bump. And sometimes somebody will show you something in the distance. They say, what? I can't see what you're talking about. I say, yeah, yeah, you look there, you look. And you can't see what they're pointing to. But a few days, of, you know, you get used to it. The, those flatness and the vast horizons and so on. And then after a while, you can you can see it. But initially, you're you're not used to it. To look in such vast distances, unless you know you have a pair of binoculars and so on. <clears throat> and of course, in our daily lives, lives, you know, we see things changing all the time, don't we? It's so obvious, but of course we just don't we don't notice it after a while. And yet, because we are caught up, you know, in this delusion of a permanent self, and we have personal preferences, personal attachments. We, because of our personal attachments, we don't want certain things to be changed, to change. Although we see things changing all the time, but because of our personal attachment, we don't want certain things, and including certain people, certain situations, you know, that we like or we're comfortable with. We don't want them to change. We want all the things and all the people that we're attached to, we want them to be permanent. Because we think in our ignorance that, you know, I am permanent, and yet we see change all the time. So this is what we call ignorance, you know. We're ignoring the fact, the truth of things. And let's be honest, 
if you don't like somebody, you don't care if they're impermanent, right? <laughs> you know? And especially you know, if they're not only unpleasant, but you know, if they've done think, bad things to you, you know, hurt you, cheat you, and so on. You know, if they have a heart attack and drop dead, thank God. <laughs> Good riddance. <laughs> Or if they get kidnapped, you know, by aliens and taken far away to another solar system. Other side of the galaxy, good riddance. <laughs> it's just human nature. And a very good example of that, you know, say if you have an old car. Have a few, you know, scratches and bumps. And it gets another scratch or a little bump. Ah, it's just an old car, no problem. Mm -hmm. But think of it, you bought a brand new car. Hmm? And you, the slightest scratch, wow, you see, right? You're so upset. Mm -hmm. The slightest scratch, because it's a brand new car, right? And if a bird flies over and drops a blessing on your <laughs> brain, <laughs> oh. You want to kill that bird, right? <laughs> that damn bird. <laughs> it's a part of our human, you know, human nature. The, the power of attachment is, is so strong. And you know, if you listen to the, the media, or the radio, TV, you hear about people dying all the time, don't we? But you know, if you don't know that person, you know, there's, you know, there, there's really no, no, no suffering. You, you might say, oh well, you know, too bad, but that's life. But if you know that person, you know, personally, of course, you're, you're more affected by that. And I remember once a close friend of mine from university days, you know, he died in an unfortunate accident. And when I heard his death being announced on the radio, it was so strange. You know, to hear someone that you know, you know, you hear on the radio that this person has died. You just can't believe it. <clears throat> now, I'd just like to do a reading here. This process of the constant change of things personal or impersonal, internal or external, goes on constantly even without our noticing it and affects us intimately in our daily life. Our relationship with people is constantly changing, with family members, relatives, friends, co-workers and supervisors and so on. Even our possessions change. Our feelings, emotions, and moods, our states of mind, our thoughts and ideas, our views and opinions, even our beliefs, our likes and dislikes, are subject to change and impermanence. Marriages are challenging and difficult simply because people change. And you know, you know what's a common. Uh, saying when people are, when couples are fighting and arguing a very common uh, saying is what happened to you you're not the person i married <laughs> <laughs> right it's so true and the reason is because we change <coughs> it's that simple Solar systems and stars are impermanent. Hills and mountains erode, likewise landscapes, the courses of rivers, coastal air is changed, the four seasons, of course you don't have the four seasons here, rainy days and dry days and so on. Understanding change and impermanence is the antidote to strong attachment and clinging and craving and ill will. Remembering death especially is a friend and teacher in Dhamma practice. 
It is a wise reminder of, her, of the folly of strong attachment and greed, aversion and ill will. How many quarrels, petty disagreements, long ambitions and enmities and grudges fade into insignificance when we remember the inevitability and certainty of death. The impermanence of all things and the evil personality. This reminds me, you might have heard the story, this is actually an event that took place during the Buddha's time. And it occurred uh, around at the ninth or tenth year of his teaching. And by then, you know, the, the Sangha had grown considerably as the, as the Buddha's reputation spread as a very radical, profound, very wise and compassionate teacher. And this event took place that threatened to split the Sangha in two, or almost in two. And it started when two monks began an argument about a very minor precept, very minor. But you know, they were the argumentative type, you know, very proud, very intellectual. And they were not too, um, too keen on, um, on mindfulness practice. You know, they rather chit chat and argue. You know, some people are like that. And the argument continued day after day. They wouldn't uh, let it go. Although the Buddha kept advising, advising the monks, you know, to, to, to be dil diligent in their practice, you know, on Dhamma reflection. <coughs> And eventually, you know, other monks began to join the argument and they began to take sides. And before you knew it, you had two fairly large groups of monks arguing about the same stupid thing, minor thing. And each day, of course, they, argued, they, were, they became more heated, you know, more deluded. And eventually, the, the Buddha stepped in. And he tried to get the monks to stop arguing and to go back to their, their practice and Dhamma studies and reflection. But they were so heated, so deluded, they just ignored the Buddha and just kept on. So the Buddha quietly went to another forest, you know, a few kilometers away. And he was happy to be, just to have his peace, peace and quiet. Because, you know, he was a solitary person by nature. And the following morning, as was the tradition, you know, when all the monks went arms around Pindabad, around the villages, the villagers asked them, where is the Buddha? Because they knew he was in the area. So they were really looking forward to offering him dana, get his blessings, and later, you know, they would get teachings from him. So the monks told the villagers what had happened, how well, they got into all this argument, and the Buddha tried to stop them, but they were so heated, so deluded, they just ignored the Buddha. So the Buddha left. And you know, the villagers did a very wonderful thing. They went on strike. And they said, since you're so disrespectful to your teacher, you don't deserve dana. Very good thing they did. And they quickly spread the word to the other villages, surrounding villages, don't give dana to these monks. They're very disrespectful. They don't deserve it. Of course, there are, there are a few monks who are not involved with the argument, but they had to also go without dana. That's the way life is. Now, you know, the, the life of those early monks, you know, their, their lives were so simple, austere, so they could manage at least one day without food. And sometimes, you know, there were like fruits, you know, wild fruits, and certain leaves they could eat, and roots, but they could manage. But after two or three or four days, huh, the pain of hunger got stronger and stronger. And eventually they came to their senses and they realized how stupid, how immature, how deluded 
they were to continue this this argument. So that's the nature of delusion, right? <coughs> when you're so heated and deluded. So they found out where where the Buddha was. They went to the Buddha, apologized, and asked for forgiveness. And the Buddha said, every day you must, in your practice and reflection, including your mindfulness practice, you must always remember the truth of impermanence and the certainty of death. Because when you consider this truth, you realize how foolish it is to cling to all these ideas, beliefs, arguments, including, you know, your, your resentments and all these things, you know, holding grudges, negativity, you see in the light of impermanence and death is completely useless. And then he ended by saying, of all mindfulness practices, that on death is supreme. But of course, you, you reflect on death not, not as something to be afraid of, but as, as a fact of life. And, and, and the reflection on death uh, as, a, as a very wise teaching is beneficial when the mind is calm. When the mind is calm and clear and you can see death not as a, something scary or not as the enemy of life, as what some, how some people see it, but just the fact of life. And that there is death simply because there is birth, right? Without birth, there would be no death. It's that simple. Now, when the Buddha said, see the world as something which is impermanent and constantly changing. See the world as something which is unsatisfactory, uncertain, simply because it is changing. And see the world as something which is devoid of permanent, separate, independent self. He was not speaking about the external, empirical world, you know, the world out there. But rather, the world of Nama Rupa, mind and body process, with its six sense consciousness. Because he said, when we really practice, we begin to see this truth. Because initially we don't see that. Again, because of our conditioning, right? We're always reacting to what we are seeing. You know, and of course, I like, I don't like, that's beautiful, that's ugly, I want, I don't want, you know, I hate that person, that person is awful, and so on. So we always feel that I am here and the world is out there. Hmm? But when we bring mindfulness in the present moment, we begin to see this very profound truth that the world actually is here. Through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking. It's a very profound teaching, but as I said, once you practice and you reflect, you begin to see this very obvious truth. For example, what is the world as we know it at this moment. It's this hall, isn't it? And you're hearing and seeing the speaker. Right? Now, the moment you step out of this room, you know, you go other parts of the Vihara, your world changes, doesn't it? It's not this room anymore. And of course, if you're taking lunch, part of your world, part of your consciousness is tasting and smelling. So even consciousness is changing. And once you get in your car and you start driving, with all that crazy traffic in KL these days, you see you're in a different world, don't you? aren't you? And you have to pay attention when you're driving. And of course, when you get home in your familiar home environment, you're in a different world. You're in, in your home environment, which you're familiar with. And if you don't turn on the television, 
and watch the news, your world, your consciousness is not affected by all that bad news. Because, you know, most news, you know, it, it's, it's bad or it's negative. Rarely you'll hear a good news. And it's always refreshing, you know, when you can hear something positive. But most of it is negative, isn't it? This is why I often advise people, try to watch as less news as possible. Because really it's a form of mental pollution. <coughs> because, you know, I know people, including my brother, they watch so much television and they have all this input because really it's, it's mental pollution when you think of it. And you see how it affects people's mind. You know, you be, it makes you very negative, very anxious, sometimes even depressed also. But the media is very powerful, right? Because you're bombarded constantly by these images. Just like I met a friend yesterday and he was telling me about the political situation in Malaysia. And I said to him, please stop you know, watching or reading the news. Mm -hmm. Or try to avoid it as much as possible. Because, you know, sometimes it's not easy. And even in Canada, I rarely watch or read the news. Mm -hmm. The only news I hear is very brief and it's usually because of the radio, you know, a few statements on the radio. I rather want to know what is happening right now, you know, the world of one's immediate environment. And just pay attention to what you're doing. And you begin to see the, the truth that the world really is here. And you see the constant change. And why things are impermanent and changing in our world is very, it's really a very simple uh, explanation. And that is, we are in truth, in fact, not this permanent I, known as Mr. Go or Mr. Tan or Bante, <laughs> but rather we are a process of body and mind. If, if we were not a process, we would not be alive. It's so obvious, isn't it? Just like our breathing, our breathing. It's constantly changing, isn't it? And when we eat, you know the process of digestion is very, very complex. But fortunately, because the body is so intelligent, we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> right? We just eat and go to sleep or do something else. But the body has this incredible intelligence to deal with this incredible thing called digestion. Once I took a course in biochemistry, and that's what we did, study about the, the body and the digestion process, and I was so amazed how complex it is. All the different enzymes and acids that are involved to, you know, to break the food down so that the body can absorb the nutrition. And of course, the rest is expelled. Very complex, and you can really appreciate the intelligence of nature, you know, the, the body. I once knew a Canadian lady who was doing a volunteer work in India and she developed a digestion uh, problem. And luckily, the foundation that she was um, involved with, it was Mahatma Gandhi, you know Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm one of his village programs, they, they have these um, na natural cure centers. <coughs> and at the natural cure center, she was able to go on a one month fast. Can you imagine one month? And everything was, you know, monitored, carefully monitored. 
And the idea was to give the, com the body a complete rest because of the digestion process so that this natural process could come back to normal. Extraordinary experience, she said. The only thing that she took was once an hour she had a teaspoon of water because you know the body, the cells need water. That's all, one teaspoon. And she said she had never felt so wonderful in her life. If you have ever fasted, you know that the first two days are really challenging. Because all you think about is food. <laughs> and all the food you have ever eaten, you, you go through all the recipes and all the different types of makan. <laughs> And even food that you've never eaten, but you would like to, to try, that come up in your mind also. It's quite extraordinary. But fortunately, after two days, the hunger goes away. And then you feel really good. You get to feel very calm, very clear. And of course, no hunger to, to worry about. Yeah, she was able to fast for, for 12, uh, one month. And she said after two weeks, it was like she was floating. You know, she felt so light, so clear. So she did yoga, there was herbal massage, herbal baths, and so on. And she came to a point where she thought, maybe I, I won't have to eat it, eat ever again. <laughs> but of course, eventually, you have to start eating again. Yeah. She lost about 25 pounds. But that was not the initial... Uh, goal, you know, to lose weight, but you do, of course, you lose weight when you're going on such a long fast. And also, when you go on a long fast, what is most important, you have to break the fast very gradually, very gradually, just to get the body used to nutrition again. It's all liquids, all liquids. I would, to be, I would like to do this. But not for a month, maybe two weeks. I would love to do one of these for two weeks to give the body a complete rest. But I said, if if you're not having from digestion problems, it's quite amazing how the body can deal with this uh, very complex uh, process. And of course, because we're a process of constant change, you can see. See how the mind is changing constantly. For example, if I if I ask you, can you tell me about how many thoughts that have arisen in your mind since you woke up this morning? <laughs> no idea. There's countless. Or how many objects you have seen? <laughs> or how many sounds you have heard? Or when you are walking, exactly how many touch sensations you experience, and so on. And of course, and of course how many breaths you have taken, you know, since, uh, say, uh, 6 o'clock or 7 a.m. this morning. So that is the reality of, of, of process. But there is a, is, there's actually a practice, mindfulness practice, when you're on a retreat, where you really focus on getting in touch with this fact of just body and mind, physical and mental process. So you, you're really in touch with it as a fact. For example, um, say if you're doing walking meditation, the movement of your feet and touching, that is the physical, or in Pali, it's called rupa, body. And the awareness of the movement and the touching is mind, nama. You see body and you see mind. Physical and mental phenomena. When you're eating mindfully and you fo you're focusing you know, the physical experience of eating, you know, tasting, chewing, swallowing, that of course is the body, physical process, and the awareness of the tasting, chewing, 
Swallowing is the mind, huh? nama. You see, rupa and nama, that's all. No I, there's no I there. And of course, with mindful breathing, the physical sensation of the breath, that is rupa, the, the body, and the awareness of the physical sensation of the breath is mind, nama. And of course, when you're on a retreat, you really see this clearly. There's only body and mind, only rupa and nama. And this is one of the, the teachings to really see the truth of uh, anatta, no self, that there's only body and mind. And also you begin to see that the I, the self, arises only when we start thinking, you know, I, I this, I that, or we start speaking. I, you know, I this, I that. The arising of I, it really comes from language, and of course thoughts, and so on. So if you ask me, who is sitting here speaking? Nama Rupa, or Rupa Nama. That's right. Of course, on the social level, you know, I'm Bante Kovida from Canada, blah, blah, blah. But at that deep level, only Nama Rupa, only body mind. And guess what? We're all Nama Rupas sitting here. <laughs> only Nama Rupa. It's actually a very profound teaching when you go into it. Because when you have this understanding, it helps us to go beyond all the social labels that we have. Right? Because as human beings, we have social labels, don't we? You know? You know, including even I'm a man or I'm a woman. It helps you to go beyond even gender. Or even I'm a mother or I'm a father. Or I'm a monk, I'm a lay person, you know? I'm a doctor, lawyer, engineer, you know, IT specialist. These are all social labels, no, aren't they? Including prime minister, president, king, queen. These are all social labels, but there is that very fundamental reality of this body and mind. And when I'm in, uh, in the UK, I like to give this teaching. Because, you know, European... Uh, civilization, including bridges, you know, they've had a long history of titles, and so many different titles, you know, of all the aristocracy and, of course, the royalty. But when you understand that whoever you are, you know, with all these titles, you're still Nama Rupa. And it doesn't matter who you are with your titles, because you're a Nama Rupa, like the rest of us, we are still subject to sickness, aging, and death. Just like hunger and thirst. But you see, when we don't have this um, understanding, this wisdom, we get so attached to labels, don't we? And titles, and you know, hierarchy, and all this stuff. <clears throat> and we begin to think that you know, people, because of their position in society, their titles, you think that they're not human anymore. <laughs> yeah, they're almost gods, or close to gods. <laughs> but that is just because we're caught in, uh, in delusion. Because of all what you call the, the, the world of social convention. And yes, we, you know, we need social convention, but it is, um, how do you say, it is artificial, and it is impermanent, right? It is impermanent. Because it doesn't matter what status you have in society, again, you're still subject to sickness, aging, and death. It's, it's that simple. And of course, you know, initially, I know for Westerners, when they first hear about that things are unsatisfactory, uncertain, they see this as something very negative, as something very judgmental. What do you mean unsatisfactory? You know, there are many things that are 
are wonderful or many things that are satisfactory? That says yes, we can, we can feel satisfied or gratified for a short time, but um, it's impermanent. We can only feel satisfied or gratified only for a short time. It doesn't last forever. It's like, you know, you could have the most wonderful meal and think, my goodness, I'll never have to eat again. <laughs> right? It's been so wonderful. The best meal you've ever had in your life. But as you know, a few hours later, the hunger comes back, right? Because we're a process. So, here's the interesting thing. Why do we, humans, keep overlooking this fact that we're a process of body and mind? Why, why is it so easily to overlook this, this fact? Well, part of it is, of course, we don't have the mindfulness. We don't have the mindfulness uh, practice and the reflection, but the main reason is because, again, we are caught in our social world of language, labels, you know, I, you, he, she, you know, and of course titles, you know, names, you know, Mr. Go, Ms. Tan, and Bante Covid, and, you know. So we, we, because of this, we tend to see ourselves as personalities, you know, ego personalities, ourselves. That's the reason. And that's why we easily overlook this fundamental fact that we are a process of body and mind, and that's where we're alive. Because once you begin to reflect on this, it is so obvious, so obvious. And why things change. The one moment you're feeling happy, and the next moment you're not feeling so happy. <laughs> it's like this. And that's the true meaning of unsatisfactoriness. It just means that anything that, that is satisfying us or anything that feels good, it doesn't last. And because things don't last, it is uncertain. And initially, some people don't like to hear that word, things are uncertain, right? You know, the, the, the fear of the unknown or the fear of change, right? This is because these are some of the fears we have. Because of our clinging mind and our, our lack of understanding, we want to be certain about certain things, right? Or, you know, we don't want certain things to change. Again, because of personal clinging, attachment. But as you know, things change whether we like it or not. And that's why the Buddha said, when we really investigate, train our minds, reflect, then we have this understanding, this wisdom. And when we have this wisdom, there is no need to believe. There is no need to believe. And again, again, this is very challenging because we're so conditioned that you must believe something or you don't believe. But believing is very different from uh, understanding. And beliefs, I, and, and again, I can understand why people cling to beliefs or to certain ideas because it gives a sense of uh, comfort, security, and in the case of uh, reincarnation, rebirth, you know, it gives you a sense that I will continue somehow after death. You know, although you're not sure, but somehow it gives you a sense of confidence. You know, I believe this, I believe that, or I believe in God. And I will have eternal life after death. It gives you, of course, a sense of confidence. So I can understand that. But you see, any belief at all is never secure because it's not based on wisdom, on understanding. And this is why if somebody says 
something and challenges your belief and say, you know, your belief is rubbish, of course you get very upset. Because the fear is there, you know, you get anxious. So beliefs are never secure. And a good example of this, we don't have to believe whether, you know, this evening is going, the sun is going to set, it's going to get dark, and tomorrow morning the sun is going to rise and it's going to be, you know, daylight again. We don't have to believe that, do we? Because we know, right, from personal experience, this is going to happen, whether we like it or not. <laughs> But I understand it's very difficult for people to let go of uh, their beliefs. And this is why now uh, I'm at the stage where I just say to people, believe what you want to believe. Anything. Doesn't matter. But understand that what is more important is present moment awareness. The practice of mindfulness. Because it's only through mindfulness we're able to overcome dukkha, mental, emotional suffering, disturbance. That is the most important thing. So believe anything you want to believe. But mindfulness is the most important thing. Now, As we said, to understand the teaching of non-self, we have to understand what self is, because we do have a self. We can't avoid it, it's a part of our conditioning. And when you investigate, you begin to see the self is created by language, social language, names, and of course thinking, thinking process. So we, to really understand the thinking process, we have to understand what thinking is. And I mentioned this last week. Because unfortunately, we're not taught to understand the thinking process in high school. At least high school level, they should be teaching this. Because we're only taught subjects, right? But they should be teaching us to understand thinking. Because we're thinking all the time. But all we are taught that we must study hard, you know, our subject, then we have to pass exams. So we can, you know, go on to college, get qualified, you, you go into the working world, and so on. Hopefully get married, having a family. But we're never taught to understand ourselves, and part of it, of course, is thinking. Because the I is a creation of thinking. And as you know, though, we need thinking in daily life, but most of our suffering comes from thinking. The dukkha really comes from thinking. When thinking becomes very irrational, very obsessive, eh? very negative, very judgmental. All that is created by thinking. And this is why they should teach this. And it's not uh, difficult, as I mentioned last week, it's not rocket science, you know, rocket science, something very complex. It's very simple. And when you investigate, you begin to see that thinking is a response to three things in the mind. Memory, past experience, knowledge, information. And when you look, you can see it. It's so obvious, isn't it? Thinking, memory, all right? Memory is obviously connected to thinking. And of course, past experience is, is related to, to memory. And of course, knowledge, information, all the knowledge, information we have is related to thinking. It's so obvious. This is when I first came upon this teaching in India. It was just such a revelation. I was so, so happy just to have that simple revelation. Because that was one of the questions I had. 
what is thinking? But nobody seems to know. <laughs> and even if you take a course, you know, when you go to college and you take a course in, you know, psychology 101, <laughs> sometimes the way they teach it, sometimes it's not even clear. They kind of go around it, like, you know, go around the bush as they say. But it's not precise. Psychology 101. And of course, or thinking because it relates to all this past information that's stored in the brain, it has that ability to project in the future. And you can see that in your own minds. So we're either thinking about things related to the past or we're projecting in the future. All our minds do this. So thinking is a movement in time. Past the future, past the future, right? You can see that. All our minds do this. And it doesn't matter what language we're thinking in. That is what is so interesting. Cantonese, Hokkien, Teochew, you know, Bahasa Malay, English, French, Russian, Japanese. It's the same thought process. Same thought process, you know, moving in time. Because that's the nature of the, the thought process, which is conditioning, based on conditioning. You know, knowledge, experience, education, and so on. And of course, the I, the self, is part of that movement in time. Memory, future plans, and so on. As I mentioned last week, you can see this more clearly when you meet somebody for the first time. And you naturally you know, talk about yourselves. And when you talk about yourselves, what do we talk about? All memories based on you know, personal history, isn't it? You know, family history, where you, know, where you grew up, education history, you know, elementary, high school, etc., etc. And if you're in the working world, of course, you have your work history. <coughs> Books you have read, movies you have seen, of course, now TV, all the TV programs, things you've seen on the internet. Mm -hmm. And if you've traveled, you speak about your traveling experiences. You speak about your, all your past experiences, some pleasant, some unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And so and so, you know, did, did this horrible thing to me. <laughs> and you cling to that unpleasant experience. And if we're not speaking ourselves relating to memory, we think about future projection, right? Plans, hopes and dreams, you know, things you like to do, things you like to achieve, and so on. You can see that. Because it's all related to thinking, this movement in time. So that is the condition. And then, of course, this is something the Buddha saw very clearly when he became awakened. Because he saw that awareness, present moment, mindfulness, was something different. Something different from the conditioning, the thought process moving in time. There's always now. Awareness is always now. That's right. It's not related to past and future. It is unconditioned. And it is our wisdom mind, the ability to see things as they are. And seeing things coming and going. See the impermanent nature of the mind. Thinking and all our mental formations, including even the beliefs we cling to. Likes and dislikes. It's all coming and going. So the Buddha, when he became awakened, he no longer identified with the thought process. Because most of us are trapped in thinking. We identify totally with the thought process. And when the mind says, I, we think this I is who we are, right? But when you become awakened, you realize the I is just a social label. It's just a thought, really. It's just a thought, just a label. 
But who we really are is the awareness, the knowing, the intuitive knowing that can see things coming and going, that whatever arises passes away. Speaking of time, how are we doing for time? <laughs> I, I forgot to bring my clock. Oh yes. So at this time, I would like to welcome some questions. Okay, one question. How do you explain um, hallucinations in the human mind, especially on, when you're aged? Uh, only aged people have, I mean, they call it dementia or whatever. Uh, they hallucinate all kinds of scenarios in the mind. Yes. How do you explain that? Same as young children having a lot of fantasy, including imagine, imagine, imagining ghosts and spirits. But it's the same thing. It, it's just a delusion of the mind. It's just delusion. But of course, a dementia is a more, um, how do you say, it's a more severe condition because it has to do with the brain cells deteriorating. So there's a loss of memory, you have hallucinations, and there's one form of dementia where people get very, uh, what, very abusive, just cursing and swearing, you know, like this. Yeah. Which is very challenging, especially when you have to live with somebody like that. You know, always screaming, shouting, cursing. It's very challenging, but it is a part, one aspect of dementia. And you know, as you know, there are different forms of dementia. And, um, What's that, uh, you, you know, that memory loss, Alzheimer's, yes. is just one kind, and there are other, other forms too, yeah. Mm. Do you know about the co coconut oil uh, therapy for dementia? Yeah. Yeah. It's on the internet. Apparently, good quality coconut oil, not the normal cooking coconut <laughs> oil, apparently if you take it, you know, if you give somebody who's having an early sign of dementia, it actually helps. There's an enzyme in good quality coconut oil that apparently stops the de deterioration of the um, of the brain cells. And the, the lady who first published this on the internet, it was a, a, a Scottish uh, a doctor, a researcher, and she and her colleagues were researching dementia and coconut oil therapy. And during the research, her husband started to show early forms of dementia. So she had the perfect guinea pig <laughs> <laughs> living at home. So every morning when she cooked him breakfast, you know, they like to eat oats, uh, oats porridge, oatmeal, she would put in like two uh, tablespoons of coconut oil and it actually uh, stopped the deterioration. And then she published it on the internet. So it's a good thing to remember. You know, if you yourself start to experience it, or you know somebody that is experiencing it, that is one possibility. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for explaining the profound knowledge using simple language. Uh, it's the first time I heard of about the concept of anatta being explained the condition set, <coughs> which is. Uh, Still, I'm trying to Of course. The condition self, as you explain, is part of memory, knowledge, and experience. So, as we pass away, I think this condition self or the I, is it part of memory that will be transferred to a new body or? You're assuming, of course, that there's a rebirth or reincarnation, right? <laughs> yes. You see, you're projecting in the future, because that's the nature of thinking. Buddha say there's a reincarnation, a re rebirth. Are you really sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> because I always say to people, he never had a Sony recording machine, and there was no video camera, you know, recording the Buddha. Always remember that. And this is why I only speak from my own 
experience and investigation. Investigation is very important. There's a part that I still cannot. Right. Cannot understand. Or cannot I know, <laughs> of course, but it takes reflection. You know, Ramana Maharshi, one of the you know one of the last great enlightened beings from India. You might have heard of him, Ramana Maharshi. Maybe another time I'll tell you about him. Because his awakening was so unique when he was only 17 years old. Can you imagine? 16, and it happened very spontaneously. Whenever he was asked this age-old question, you know, what happens to me when I die? Or, you know, where do I go from death? He gave a wonderful answer. He said, tell me, when you go to bed at night and you fall asleep, where do you go? <laughs> <laughs> Reflect on that. Because when we fast, when we fall asleep, of course, there's no thinking and no I. Because that's the nature of consciousness. Consciousness is always changing. And of course, when we all go to bed tonight, unless you're too scared, where you want to stay up all night, <laughs> we actually die every night, mentally, psychologically, for about two hours where there's absolutely no consciousness. So even Malaysia does not exist, even KL. And if you don't like the government, you'll be happy to know in that deep sleep state, the government does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> Including people you don't like. <laughs> yeah. This is why there's an old saying. <coughs> You know, when people are in deep sleep and they're not aware of anything, we say, that person is dead to the world. <laughs> you remember that saying? Yeah. yeah. And in a way, it's true. You know, physically, you might be alive, but you know, mentally, psychologically, no consciousness. That's, that's the nature of consciousness. So, but yeah, you say the Buddha may not say rebirth. Yeah, he meant something different. But my understanding, and remember now, is my understanding. Because I, I've had the case where I, I um, explained my understanding. And you know what people did? They ran around the whole place. I oh, but the coda from Canada, he don't believe in Rupert. He don't believe in Rupert. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. From my understanding, my own experience and investigation, I see you for sure, I see rebirth in the mind, mm -hmm. mental rebirth. They're rising and passing away, you know, of thoughts, ideas, images, mental formation. You can see things arising and passing away of feelings, sensations, because we're a process, that is it. This rebirth I see for sure. You understand? So, in other words, the aim in practice is to stop rebirth in the mind. So there's less dukkha and more peace. Or, because it's so challenging, so difficult, you can say, at least lessen, huh? lessen the mental rebirth. You know, the craving, the clinging, you know, the aversion, the hatred, the jealousy, the delusion. Does that make sense? Yeah. So to yes, <laughs> yeah. But you see, part, part, part of the difficulty, and I realize, is the, the, is the word itself, rebirth. You know, it's the moment you, because we're using the word, this word with birth in it, we, we think, to, we tend to think of some physical phenomena, right? You know, that something goes into another body. It's like, when we first hear the word birth and death, we naturally think of physical birth, physical death, don't we? Yes. You know, a baby being born and somebody dying. Naturally. But when we practice and we focus our minds in the present moment, you see that there's much more to birth and death than, you know, physical birth, physical death. Again, a rising and passing away of phenomena. Things happening all the time. That's right. Things happen. Yeah. I one more follow-up question. Uh, how do you reconcile story of out-of-body experience and uh, people can remember past life. Yes, yes, I know. I've heard all this before. Put it this way. From early childhood, I've always had a good memory. 
and don't say it's because of past karma. <laughs> it was just my genetic makeup. And being the last of six children, my older brothers and sisters were always amazed how I could remember things so early. Because they just thought I was, you know, I was too young. But I could remember. Now I say this not to be boastful, but to show you the fact that if it's one thing I don't remember, is a previous birth. <laughs> You understand? So when I hear all these stories, you know, I'll have people having all these memories, say, oh yeah, interesting, but to me, it's not interesting. I, I focus more on the Four Noble Truths. Hmm? The truth of Dukkha and the ending of Dukkha. And the Buddha always came back to this one point. Whatever you're discussing, debating, you always came at this one point. I only teach one thing. The truth of Dukkha and the ending of Dukkha. Okay? <laughs> but sometimes I joke when people ask, talk about reincarnation, rebirth. I said, you know, in my previous life I used to believe that, but in this life I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and some people don't even get the joke. <laughs> they give me this horrified look. I go, what, what kind of Buddhist monk are you? <laughs> yes, any other questions? Yes. I have this uh, sort of uh, feeling uh, like uh, somebody close to me uh, or about past life, which I don't know. But actually, it happens after that sort of feeling. Why, why it caused my mind? What do you, you, you feel the person or you imagine the person being no, no. there? There are signs to tell me that somebody uh, close to me is in the past. Uh huh. That, that sort of feeling. Is, is it a mind or is it how, how it happens? I don't know. Right. Yeah. Well, as we said, everything comes from the mind. So anything we experience or imagine, it all comes from the mind. But as I said, life is a great mystery. So in some ways, anything is possible. Well, I know what you mean. Sometimes you have a premonition that someone has died. Yeah. So I would say it's just a natural instinct. It just, I just say it's just a natural instinct. If I really don't know the person, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's just a natural instinct. And some people have that and some people don't. You know, it's like that. And you know that very amazing coincidence. But that happens all the time. You know, you think of a person yet you haven't thought of in a long time. And you get email from them, or you know, or, or you get a phone call from yeah, them, yeah. out of the blue. Yeah, correct, yeah. This happens all the time. Yeah. But it's just a coincidence, and of course, being human, and we have the same makeup. Of course, we are connected. We are connected. You know, it's just like we can feel compassion even for strangers. And this is why. Quite, I, when, quite far away, then uh, the, the person who stays quite far away. Yes. Yes. I, I really uh, find it very strange. You have great psychic powers. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when people talk about psychic powers, I like to say that the greatest psychic power of all is to have compassion for all beings in the world. That is, to, to me, that is the greatest psychic power to really empathize you know, with the, with the suffering and joys of all beings in the world. But the other psychic power stuff, ah, not too important. Regarding Sota Parma, the seven rebirth, is this rebirth painter rebirth or is it? You know you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> I know, you know, when I first came to Malaysia in 74, 75, and that was a past life. Yes. Because to me, that's what past life is. Yesterday is a past life, you know, last week, Monday is a past life. You know, when I was here in 94, 95, of course it's a past life. Now, when you, you know what's interesting? Just before I come to your question, when we think of past lives, for the, we think of lives that are separate from this life. 
But when you really investigate and you practice, you begin to see that we have been through many lives from childhood. Many, many. And a good example of this, if you could find all your photos, you know, from early childhood, and you line them up until today, or recent photos, do, do you ever look the same? No. Of course not. Constantly changing. Again, the reality of process, body and mind. That's right. So, um, yes, yeah, so to go back to your question again, can you just repeat it? Oh, Satapan, yeah. Yeah, why I brought up 1974 is because when I came here and subsequent visits to Malaysia, you know, the Burmese method was very popular. You know, Mahasisaida, and if you study uh, Burmese method and their teaching, is a lot, you go, they go into detail, right? Satapana, Anagami, Anaragami, blah, 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 jhana one, jhana two, jhana three, jhana four, up to even ten jhana. <laughs> And people, of course, are caught in praying. They want to achieve this, 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 this. So much headache, so much delusion. And I always say, because I'm not a scholar, that all these levels of attainment that you read about, about what the Burmese teacher, yes, they are interesting, but they are only concepts. <coughs> Don't cling to them. Same with jhana. I've met so many people, they were chasing jhanas, they get, got very confused. And after a while, they didn't know what jhana they, they were in. Am um, I in one, two, three, four, or 1.2, 2.7, 3.3? You know what I mean? It only encouraged craving, more craving, more dukkha. This is why I rarely use that word jhana, because it's been polluted. I rather use the word stillness. <laughs> stillness. In India, of course, they use samadhi. But it's the same thing. Yeah, just stillness. So I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> yes. Okay.